thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you for putting together some of these great bills. So I, I want to talk about this, uh, what it does, why it matters, uh, because from some of the comments about this bill, you would think it's the end of all regulatory oversight on refineries as we know it, and this is not true, of course. Regulations and standards governing U.S. refineries are some of the strictest in the world, but this EPA seems to believe the following faulty logic, that if one regulation is good, then 10 more must be better. Now, truthfully, they're taking aim at all things fossil fuel um, and the things that Americans rely on. And my bill simply seeks to put a stop to a highly unnecessary EPA rule that frankly came out of nowhere and for no good reason. So I want to explain what the EPA did and why it doesn't make sense. This rule requires companies to provide what's called a safer technology alternative analysis, which of course sounds innocuous, but the EPA wants refineries to assess the feasibility of replacing specifically hydrofluoric acid alkylation units, a very typical unit for refineries to use with something else, they don't say what. The reason the EPA wants companies to conduct this reporting is because this administration, at the urging of radical environmental groups, believes hydrofluoric acid alkylation units pose a safety risk. Now, to comply with the safety requirements in the rule, according to at least one report from Becht Engineering, refineries really only have one option, which is to swap their alkylation units with sulfuric units, which is the only other commercially viable alternative. Now, the cost of that would be billions of dollars, plus refineries would have to shut down their operations for up to three years to make the change. So how many refineries would this affect? Nearly 50 active refineries use hydrofluoric acid alkylation units, and that, that produces about half the country's gasoline. So that's 50% of all refining capacity. So the footprint of this rule cannot be overstated. In fact, at a recent hearing before this committee, when we talked about this issue, the former Deputy Secretary of Energy said we shouldn't ever want to imagine a scenario where we lose 50% of our refining capacity, and yet that's exactly what the proposal is. So at a minimum, in the best case scenario, this proposed rule would be a paperwork exercise and a total waste of time for companies. And the worst case scenario is refineries go offline for three years, pay billions of dollars to comply with the rule, which we know that, that cost will get passed on to consumers and the Americans we all represent. Everyone's talking about how dangerous hydrofluoric acid is and that it's too risky for refineries to use it. But let's think about something. What's the only other alternative? Sulfuric acid. Not exactly something you'd want to go shower in, the CDC says. Ex excessive exposure can result in death. Uh, any exposure is destructive of skin, eyes, teeth, and lungs. Sulfuric acid alkylation units need three times the space and three times the frequency of delivery as hydrofluoric acid. So that means more trucks, more trains transporting sulfuric acid to refineries so they can make their product. Ironically, it turns out this rule will probably make it more likely that there will be a dangerous chemical accident than if we had just left these refineries alone to safely use hydrofluoric acid like they have been for years without any proven harm from an accident. Now, a lot of my Democrat colleagues like to cite the Philadelphia incident, the release of hydrofluoric acid, but the after action report, the Chemical Safety Board said it's unaware of any offsite impacts from the hydrofluoric acid release. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the refining industry has some of the lowest rates of incidents with non-fatal injuries and illnesses out of more than 500 manufacturing sectors, uh, including as compared to any other major industrial sector. Um, from the EPA's own data that it used to justify this proposal shows zero off-site fatalities and only one incident that resulted in off-site property damage as a result of hydrofluoric acid. Also, basically everything, only 2% of hydrofluoric acid demand is for the refining industry. So for all of this fear-mongering, there's zero data whatsoever to support the claims of widespread negative health impacts from hydrofluoric acid. Both hydrofluoric and sulfuric acids have their risks just like the chlorine we buy for our pools and the bleach we buy at Walmart. And just like everything else, they can be managed. Any rational human being knows this. By the way, the refineries that do this and use it, they do manage it. Their units are monitored 24 hours a day by individuals who undergo all sorts of training and accident simulation scenarios. They're equipped with high sensitive uh, lasers, chemical spot detectors, cameras, all of which trigger visual and audible alarms if any irregularity is found. If that happens, monitors can engage isolation valves to sequester the chemical within minutes. And there's, there's cases where this happens, and there, there's been, there's been um, no dangerous outcomes as a result. So, look, th this, this really comes down to a cost-benefit ratio in the, in, the, in the time I have left here, which I'm running out of. Um, it's a method to choke off oil and gas production. My bill stops that. The EPA can't place an outright ban on hydrofluoric 
acid units. So they're putting a rule out that can be used against refineries to shut them down completely and eventually. That was even admitted as, as so by the, the last hearing we had when the Democrat, the minority witness stated that the goal was indeed to shut them all down. And I, I wonder if the funders of his nonprofit are the ones who pay his gas bills. So if we want to keep our gas prices low, help our constituents and keep these refineries online, we don't need to drag them down with these proposals and my bill would stop that. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Crenshaw. Uh, thank you to the gentleman. I just want to address a, a few of the points made. You know, I'd, I'd like this to be a debate, but for it to be a debate, it's you got to address the points that I've made. I was told that it was it was just broad rhetoric, but nothing I said was broad at all. I stated very specific facts about, say, how many accidents have actually happened. Pointing now, the, the point of of that data, of course, is to point out that this is a solution in search of a problem that doesn't exist. We keep saying it's unsafe. Why? Well, we're not sure. It's just a chemical, so it's scary. That's broad rhetoric. I would like someone to, to, to actually address the arguments that were made. What, what happens when you take off 50% of refining capacity? Maybe only two refineries in California, but we're a big country. 50% of refining capacity is not nothing. It's significant. I bet we can't find a single steel worker that even knows what we're talking about right now. I'm sure that their leadership is opposed to it. They live in my neighborhood. The people of color that you want to protect, they're my neighbors, and they work at these places. Nobody actually, they talk about them in these broad strokes like they're, like, like it's some, I don't even know. These are my neighbors, left, right, across the street. I swear to you, that's true. They work at these places. They want their jobs. They're not worried about hydrofluoric acid because they're trained how they could figure through months and months of training to learn how to operate it safely. Nobody's addressed the all bills from trains. Would anyone care to address that? I, we have two minutes and 45 seconds. If anyone would address on the other side who opposes this, those points I just made, I will yield that time. No, well, Gary Palmer will yield the time. If not, I will. I yield back to my friend from Alabama. Thank you. I, I thank the gentleman. I would just add this, Mr. Chairman, and 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 to my colleague from Texas. One of the things that has really undermined our economic and national security is the failure to uh, upgrade and expand our hydrocarbon infrastructure. And if we continue down this path. Uh, there's going to be some enormously negative consequences for our country. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Any others wish to speak on the bill? If not, uh, are there any amendments? The question now occurs on forward. Move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from uh, New Jersey, Thanks, Mr. Plum. It's also offensive to the gentlewoman from California. Uh, thank you. Well, the first point I'm going to make is saying that only radical environmentalist is a broad sweeping statement. It's also offensive, I think, to the United Steelworkers to say there's probably not a single actual worker who believes this. After, after having this letter submitted. So I think it's a little offensive, and I myself going to apologize to the U, United Steelworkers for comments that insinuate that this letter is false. And it's just offensive, first of all. So that's the, one of the broad strokes, strokes I was mentioning. The other one is, if California has been able to do it, other places can do it. And people care about their health care. People care about their health. So to suggest that, if somebody has a job in an industry, all they care about is the job but not their health, I think is also disingenuous. Now, under this bill, a facility can't even look to see if there are ways to make their operations safer by using one of the many alternatives for hydrofluoric acid because the author of this bill would rather we not burden chemical companies with the truth of the dangers that lie at their facilities. I'm hoping to use the rest of my time to ask some questions of counsel, if we could, to 
clear up the intent of this bill. Okay. This bill amends section 112R of the Clean Air Act, which is the authority for the EPA's risk management program. Is that correct? Congresswoman, the uh, H.R. 1155 is called up, to, is a standalone piece of legislation. It does not amend the Clean Air Act. Is it? Okay, here. Okay, the author of this bill has also said that the risk management plan rule came out of nowhere. I would love for the gentleman to come to my district and to visit communities where refineries pose a risk to communities. The gentleman lady is reminded to make your comments to the chair. I would invite the chair and the gentleman who made the comment, the author of the bill, to come to my district and visit communities where refineries pose a risk to fence line communities and the people in our neighborhoods and tell them that their worries are unfounded. We heard that these are workers from the right and the left and across the street, and that is true. But these are people's lives. And residents who live around these facilities care about their health and they care about the risk it poses. Or go into a community in West Texas where the chemical explosion led to these chemical safety rules being initiated under the prior administrations. In this particular case, it was the Obama administration. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this bill and return to common sense on chemical safety. And I yield back. Um, thank you to the gentleman, and, and, and thank you to the gentlelady for, for engaging with this. I, 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 this is how Congress should work, so this is good. And, and I want to address very respectfully a couple of the points made. So one of the points was made that if California can do it, everyone can. The thing is, is gasoline, oil, petroleum, all of it, it's a global market. So it, if it, the state of California could stop all refining, it would have to be picked up somewhere in the U.S. So it's not a valid argument, just economically speaking. Also worth noting that the California policies haven't been so great to the people of California, driving electricity prices up 50% higher than the U.S. national average, um, causing disproportionate harm on low-income residents. The list goes on. Um, and I would say, with respect to the workers, of course they want to go to work, but they also want to be safe. That's of course true. And so as policymakers, we have, to, we have to weigh these costs and benefits. Because look, I can keep somebody safe and keep them home forever, locked up, and guarantee that they'll never come in contact with anything dangerous in the outside world. Right? That's obviously the extreme end of that logic, but it's faulty logic. Now, if we're gonna advocate for drastic change in a very, very important industry, such as refining, which every single American uses every single day, and they're very, very sensitive to the price of that gasoline, as we've seen in the last few years. If you're gonna advocate for that drastic change, then you have to make a very compelling case that they're indeed in danger at these facilities. That case has not been made. I will happily go to your district. I've lived for, in California for 10 years. I, I, I grew up in the oil and gas industry. I'm from Houston. It's not like we don't know what a refinery looks like. And look, the, 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 this specific explosion that you're talking about, there was, in California in 2015, in Torrance, there was zero hydrofluoric acid released. Zero. This, this entire argument is coming from a piece of shrapnel that almost hit a tank. That's where it's coming from. And in, and in a case in, 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 in um, what was it, Philadelphia or... In the other case, where hydro, I mentioned it earlier, where, where hydrofluoric acid was released, it didn't hurt anyone. So this case has just not been made. We're potentially targeting 50% of America's refining capacity for nothing. We get no benefit from this. We're not saving anyone's lives because no one's life has been taken by this. That's a problem in just how we're thinking about this and I think, and, and how we're, we're acting as policymakers. And then I think that's a radical thing for our EPA to do. Well, and, gentlemen, and this, bill, this bill stops, I'll yield. Well, I don't, well, I don't have the power so, to yield. I don't have the power to yield. I, I yield back to my friend. my time, and I Buddy yield Carter. to the gentlelady from California. Well, I, you made a very interesting comment, and I would love your response to this. So are you saying because nobody has died yet and there hasn't been an explosion, we shouldn't do anything about it when we know it's harmful? Because that's what you just said, and that's okay. what doesn't make any sense to me. How, why would we wait for an entire community to be exploded out and to be killed? I understand. Please, please clarify. Reclaiming my time, and I yield back to the gentleman for Texas, and I'm going to wear stripes next time. 
<laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> So we absolutely do do something about it. Um, in, my, in my commentary uh, earlier, I listed the many, many things that take place at a refinery to make them safe. From, uh, from, from the sensors and from the training, it is not like we do nothing. Again, we're, we're having this conversation as if we're starting from year zero, where we've never regulated this before. But that's, of course, not true. We regulate it dramatically. What's more, every industry in the US that uses hydrofluoric acid, they're subject to regulatory oversight from six different agencies. I'll list them. The EPA, OSHA, Department of Transportation, DHS, DOD, and local emergency planning committees. This is not an unregulated issue. It's not an unregulated industry. We're act we're in, but that seems to be the starting point here. And, and we should start from an honest starting point and go from there. And I yield back. 